Too Bright to See by Kyle Lukoff Chapter 10 The next morning I'm groggy. No dreams, luckily. Or maybe it's not luck. Maybe Uncle Roderick knows that I'm going to find out what's going on, why he hasn't left yet, and so he doesn't need to tap into my subconscious to give me messages. I yawn through breakfast and then hop on my bike. I haven't ridden into town all summer. There's not much to do there besides go to the library, and I haven't been in the mood for new books. But that's where I'm going to find some information. It's a long ride. Our driveway is a gravel road a mile long, thick with trees on all sides. The street we officially live off, Sullivan Road, is hard-packed dirt. I wonder what it's like to have neighbors. Every pump of my legs on the pedals brings me that much farther away from my house. My breath comes fast, my heart pounds. From exertion instead of fear for a change... I haven't been this far from home since that day at Mora's, and since then I've been outside, avoiding my house, or inside, and having bad dreams and dealing with them. Breathing hard, pedaling fast, trees blurring past me, I'm more relaxed than I have been in a long time. I've never had the urge to get away from something before, and never understood how much relief it could bring. The book Mom brought home pops into my mind. I like the idea that there are stages of grief you can move through in a nice and orderly way that ends with acceptance. I also wonder if this whole ghost thing is a kind of bargaining, like Uncle Roderick making some bargain with the universe or with the afterlife. He's allowed to stay a little longer because, well, I don't know why yet. That's what I have to find out. Or maybe I'm bargaining. Maybe I'm keeping him here somehow because I don't want to let him go. If I was really at acceptance, then he'd be able to rest in peace. But no, it can't be my fault that part of him is still here. He has to know that I just want him to be okay, and if he can't be okay and alive, I want him to be okay with being dead, even if it means leaving us behind forever. I'll figure it out. Half an hour of riding and I'm at the library. I push open the doors and inhale deeply as the air conditioning washes over me. I hadn't noticed how hot I was until now, but my faded black t-shirt is sticking to my chest and my forehead is damp with sweat. Mrs. Goldman, the librarian, waves at me as I come in and I wave back before going over to the computer. I come here all the time during the school year, sometimes on my own, sometimes with my mom or my uncle. Mrs. Goldman moved here from New York City, too, so they would chat about that a lot. She was one of the people I couldn't bring myself to speak to at the wake. I type a few keywords into the catalog. Ghost, haunted, supernatural, write down a few call numbers, and meander over to the stacks stopping at a few shelves along the way, so anyone watching won't see me making an anxious beeline for that section. The library is mostly empty, so I don't know what prying eyes I'm afraid of, but you never know who might be peering at you from between the shelves. Once I've aimlessly wandered over to the exact section I need, I pull out a stack of titles that look helpful. One is like an encyclopedia of the supernatural, Another is about ghost sightings around the world. A few other books that might be too similar to help, but still could be useful. I carry them over to a table tucked into a corner, set them down with a satisfying thump, and settle in to read. I've always loved ghost stories, but have only ever read fiction. Some based on a true story, but everything I know about ghosts is from folk tales and chapter books and movies. It never seemed important to research the different presences in my house, any more than it felt necessary to learn about the different woods that make up the doors and the roof and the kitchen table. But that was before one of them tried to get my attention. Two hours later, I still don't know for sure why Uncle Roderick is haunting me, but I have a slightly better idea. 
There is the possibility that it's not actually the ghost of my uncle. It could also be a poltergeist, which literally means noisy spirit. They're a type of ghost known for slamming doors, breaking mirrors, throwing knickknacks, or books, or even furniture around a room. I read a bunch of descriptions of poltergeists, and it sounds a lot like what's been happening at home. Also, apparently, they can be caused by extreme distress inside a person, especially a young person. I'm a young person. And I guess losing Uncle Roderick counts as distress. But I'm not convinced that it's a poltergeist, because usually everyone in a house knows when there's one poltering around, and Mom hasn't noticed anything at all. I didn't read any accounts of poltergeists only poltering one person, like a target. Excuse me, dear, a voice says, and my whole body convulses in surprise. I was so absorbed in research that I didn't notice the librarian coming over. Oh, sorry, is it time to close up? My voice is a little shaky. No, not quite yet, and I'm so sorry to startle you, but... There's a new boy in town. He's come to visit the library several times, and I thought he might like to meet another young person. And there is someone behind her. A boy, around my age, blonde hair and hazel eyes, exactly as tanned as me. The kid Mora heard about, who moved into the Baumler's old farmhouse? He's wearing plaid shorts and a bright white t-shirt, and suddenly I feel extremely grubby. I'm not used to meeting new kids, but I stand up from my chair and stick out my hand for him to shake. My name's Griffin, he says, as Mrs. Goldman walks away. I'm Bug, I tell him. He cocks his head in surprise at my name, but doesn't say anything about it, which I like. We sit down at the table, books spread across it. We just moved here from Portland, he says. My parents used to be lawyers, but they both hated it. We moved into some old farmhouse. My mom is writing a novel, and my dad is figuring out how chickens and goats and things work. It's okay. I'm pretty sure our house is haunted, though. Perfect! I exclaim. He looks confused, which makes sense. That's not a normal thing to say. I hasten to explain. My house is haunted, too! That's why I came to the library, why I have all these books. I want to learn more about ghosts. One specific ghost, really, but I don't tell him that. Believing in ghosts is one thing, but explaining to this total stranger that my dead uncle has come back to tell me something is probably a little too much. Oh, he laughs with a flash of purple braces. That is kind of perfect. Have you learned anything good? A lot. First, ghosts don't haunt people for no reason. Sometimes it's because a person died in a way that left something of them behind, and now a little bit of their energy is still stuck doing something over and over. Those hauntings only happen because you're in a place where something bad happened to someone. I cringe for a second, worried that I'm coming off as abnormally obsessed, but Griffin just nods thoughtfully. Could that explain weird sounds, like someone walking up and down stairs? Definitely, I say. For a second, I wonder where this bug, who's talking so confidently to some strange boy, came from. But ghosts make sense to me, and Griffin seems happy to listen, so I barrel ahead. If there are any random cold spots that never warm up, that's why. This all explains a lot of the random ghostly things that have happened in my house since forever. But there are other kinds of ghosts too, right? That do things on purpose? Griffin is flipping through one of the books now, stopping at a photograph with a white splotch hovering behind a grinning toddler. Yeah, there's a prickling down the back of my neck. It's fun to talk about, but this is real for me. It might be real for him, too. Sometimes ghosts haunt people into doing things, or because there's something that person needs to know like avenging their death, or solving a mystery, or passing along a message. I find the chapter I was reading and pass it over to him. Those hauntings sometimes mimic a poltergeist, Griffin reads aloud, and can manifest in a variety of ways. Witnesses have observed objects floating or breaking dramatically. 
Sounds scary. Yeah, I say. I'm glad I've never seen anything like that. Yikes. Griffin continues to look through the book, pointing at another paragraph. It also says that these types of hauntings are usually localized, which means they only happen in one place, but they can also follow a person around. I wonder if there are any at the library, he asks, looking around dramatically. I look under the table, which makes him laugh. Ghost free, I exclaim, but the memory of the voice in the creek ripples through my mind. We both pour over our books for a while. It's a companionable quiet, though, like we've already gotten close enough to not have to talk. For a moment, it feels okay, like we're just two kids looking at books. But then that narrator in my head starts describing the scene, a girl in ratty clothes, sitting across from this new boy, who is objectively cute, and where any normal story might go from there, I tell myself that I'm being ridiculous. I barely know him, but I can't focus on the words in front of me because I'm suddenly convinced that everything about me, my hair, my clothes, is completely wrong compared to this boy, who is effortlessly right in the same way Mora is an effortlessly right girl. I have to go before he realizes that everything is wrong with me and am frantically casting about for an excuse to run away when he points to a page and says, Hey, this is interesting. What? I say, trying to sound like I didn't just invent something to panic about. According to this, the first kind of ghost, the trapped energy kind, can stick around forever, just doing the same things like an endless loop. And the second kind... The ones that want to pass a message along can't stick around forever. They're drawn to the afterlife, but force themselves to stay here to finish whatever it is they need to finish. The longer they stick around, the more stretched, it seems like, they become between this world and the next. Oh no, I have so many questions. But if I sound too worried, Griffin will wonder why. How long do I have? What happens if Uncle Roderick gets stuck here? What if he gets pulled away before I figure this out? The library is closing in ten minutes, calls Mrs. Goldman, and I jump. Is it almost six o'clock already? I hope Mom isn't wondering what happened to me. Griffin pulls a phone out of his pocket and looks at the screen. My mom is waiting outside. I want to check out this book first, though. My heart sinks a little. That was the only one I had wanted to take out. I need it more than him, but I can help you clean up, he continues. She won't mind waiting. She's been wanting me to make new friends. A bubbly sensation rises through my chest. Who is this boy who just says things like that, just assumes that someone would want to be his friend? Is that how people make friends? By believing that it's possible, even likely? I try to smile in a way that looks normal and friendly and not completely flabbergasted. That's okay, I say. I took them out. I can put them back. But maybe I'll see you around. We could do something or something. We could do something or something? Brilliant, bug. He smiles. Cool. You want to put my number in your phone? Crap. I don't have a phone. I mean, my house does. I don't. I'll probably get one before middle school starts, though. That probably isn't true, but it could happen. Is he going to think I'm some old-fashioned weirdo? I am an old-fashioned weirdo, I guess, but he doesn't need to know that right away. No worries. I'll write it down for you, he says like it's no big deal. He grabs a piece of scrap paper and a pencil while Mrs. Goldman checks out his book, scribbles down a name and number, and waves goodbye. Well, that was unexpected, but nice. I fold up the paper and stick it in my pocket, then pile up the stack of books and bring them back to the section. I put them away, one at a time, enjoying the rasp of cover against cover. As I'm walking out of the aisle, a loud thump comes from behind me. I turn, and one of the books I just put away is lying on the floor. It's the one that taught me about ghosts passing along messages, about how they only haunt the living if they have something they need to communicate. I know I put it away right. It wouldn't fall on its own. 
Okay, okay, I say out loud. I get it. I slide the book back and it stays this time. I don't need to check it out because I already know what it's trying to tell me. This isn't one of the normal stages of grief. I have to figure out what Uncle Roderick wants from me.